And with that, is it still working? It seems to be working. I mean, it's hard to believe, but it doesn't work until my face gets on. I was on that kill it. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> It should be following your eyes. Perfect right there. Awesome. Did anyone else want it? No. Oh. no. But we're, re and we're recording. Well, thank you, Ron. Thank you, John, for the invitation to you know, share a little bit here. And I actually have to also um, thank Tim Walsh because it was when I was like dreaming up this idea that I was telling Tim, well, yeah, I'm doing this ranch, I'm also like, into this recovery stuff, and you know, I'm thinking that that would kind of be relevant. And then I'm like, hey, R3. And so I called Tim and I'm like, I think I found my name. He goes, so the R3. And he said, well, that's great, John. That's a great name. So there's already an R3. I said, <laughs> All right, well, let's go back to the uh, drawing. Board. So uh, I was already channeling with this group before I even knew it. Um, you know, and thanks for the, the bio, you know, you always put together bios and it's like, okay, will they read the whole thing or not? And, and thank you, you know, and, and all of that, you know, I was up at the National Institute for Health once and the director says, what are we missing, you know? And that day I had been real spiritual feeling and, you know, I was like a little intimidated. I don't know why I'm at this table, all these PhDs and doctors and other people, and they're all going around the room on back so and so this and that and I'm thinking well what should I introduce myself as so I said well my name is John Magnuson and I'm the dad of Ellen Ava and they all laughed and you know it was a nice icebreaker well I had no idea um, how the good Lord was about to use me that day because when the director asked what are we missing in our research and my hand went up I'm like why is my hand going up? I have no question you know and then I was like uh he called on me and I was like, um, why, what, why are, what's in the power of prayer that we're missing that connection? And what stemmed to that was this scientific, you know, thing on NPR that I was listening to on the drive over there where they were talking about when the guy that's cutting the grass cuts the grass and we smell that fresh grass, that's actually the cells of the grass talking to each other. Hey, the guy with the machete is coming again. Hi, well, the grass can't run, you know? So, but it talks to each other. And so I think that's where that question came from is when I'm praying about somebody and then my phone rings, why does that happen? I mean, it's that power of connection. And so this was a time in my life where, you know, I was going to change, you know, all the stuff I had done first with Jim Ramstead here, came to the dance with that. You know, and I'm like, okay, this guy's in recovery, and so I'm helping out the recovery community. And, you know, and then later, like, I realized I can't stop drinking, so I joined the club. And hey, my name's John, I'm an alcoholic or a person in long term recovery. And then it went on after that, where Rammer, as I called him and filled me mags, he's like, thanks, you gotta go out and help people. And I'm like, you help people. I'm holding on by my fingernails. Like, you know, I'm just trying to stay sober, you know? I had quit for three years and went out one night, drank one night and ended up in a jail cell. And I thought I was doing everything right. I was doing meetings, I was involved, I was doing everything. Well, obviously I wasn't, if that was my outcome. So that's when I'm like, all right, all these programs that we have, which I was like, I told them, well, you just, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and move on. And then I'm like, all right, wrap as many programs as you have around me and start putting supports. So I didn't know it at that time, but bring all of that activity forward. I just feel like what this recovery ranch is, is just an extension or a creation out of my life experience. And then I never had the idea to be doing coaching or peer supports or health ministry again. You know, I'm in recovery. I'm a person in long-term recovery. I'm an alcoholic. There's lots of different language we can use. And I'm not one that likes to get into the language police because the language is pertinent to some community. So why would I want to change their language? But what I believe now through my training as a peer and as a coach is that I'm ordained 
in a spiritual 12 step path of recovery. But as I've become multilingual, that doesn't mean that I can't walk with people that are in celebrate recovery, or I can't walk with people that are in smart recovery, or Dharma recovery, or you know, my guy that I walked with in Dharma, I'm like one day I'm like, hey, I go to more Dharma meetings than you go to. You know, what's going on? That's not even my path, you know. But that's where we have learned in this continuation of moving from episodal care to a continuum of care, that we've got to meet the person where they're at, not where we're at, not where our silo can to be, because that's the only place we can get funded. So you got to fit into our silo or you know, like we send you away and somehow you get well and come home and then you just go to this. Well, all right, that worked for about half the people. And great. Some people think that's a failure. I think anything that works for uh, that large of a people, like AA is a huge success, a huge win. And we should be celebrating that rather than saying that we somehow move beyond these things. No, that works perfectly for that group of people. And so that's what's informed this thinking that was happening. And then, you know, bring it to, I'm in DC and then I moved back to Minnesota and I'm talking to John Curtis at the retreat. And I said, yeah, I think God is moving me. You know, like I'm helping millions of people through laws and regulations, but I think I'm supposed to be helping people. And he's like, well, work here and you'll figure out if you want to work with people in a hurry. So I was the intake guy at the retreat, you know, best job I've ever had in life, you know. I'm sitting there, you know, checking what you're bringing in up. Oh, sorry, that can't come in or, you know, welcome and totally loved it. Just that opportunity of service. And I'm like, all right, God, I do not understand what this plan is, but I think you're finding the groove I'm supposed to be in. And then somebody said, well, you still have a family and you need to feed them. So maybe you should make a little more than you do being the intake guy at the retreat and this association job to lead March, you know, the Minnesota Association of Resources and Recovery for Chemical Health. And like I always say, after I learned how to say that, I wish I could just change it to April, you know, like, uh, <laughs> you know, like it was a lot. And I said, maybe we should think about changing the name, but you, you work on certain things. But you know, in doing, Can you say that one more time. It's, no, it's I got lucky. Uh, I got it all out, so I'm not even going to try. Still working. That. So it's it's that this movement, and when I applied for that, I didn't really even want the job. You know, I answered totally honestly. You know, like, and and they gave me the job, and that's when I was like, all right, again, I feel like God's putting me in a place, and what I thought. I was planted there at the time for was to be able to grab the hand of where our field came from, 12 steps spiritual recovery, to where I see it going, which is genetics, analytics, you know, like powerful ways that we can read where you're going to have a problem before you even recognize that you're going to have a problem. And that's fascinating. The same way that my hand went up when I was at the National Institutes of Health. And I'm like, it's fascinating why this thing of power of prayer and power connects us. And so these, I just share these and, you know, good enough to give a shameless plug of the little flyer. Coming up on the 31st is the big reveal. I'm going to hand those up. So, so, so I, I like to call today the, the special peak, you know, before we get to the big reveal. And, you know, at the big reveal, we're going to learn about the recovery ranch. But before we get to the recovery ranch, um, we've got to, like, do what we're doing now on this continuum of care. And that's we need to support our coaches or our peers or this new workforce that's coming on the line. That's going to, in my opinion, move people across these silos to be able to serve a continuum of care and get people to the right level, get people to the right professional, get people to the right place, get people to the right community. All these ideas that have been bubbling up prior to, um, you know, being in this position. And so I'm leading the association and I'm working with a family because I learned to do interventions 
from the Johnson Institute and, you know, folks way back when. So I've been doing those for decades. And it was on a time working with a family where, um, you know, we got their loved one to a treatment center. And I looked at the mom and dad and said, okay, nice to meet you. And I got to get back to my day job, you know? And, and the mom looked at me and said, you're not going any. And I was a little puzzled. And she said, we've been working on these issues for you know, a decade. And when you're in the room, I hear my son. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's a powerful statement for somebody to make. And I don't even know what she's talking about. I'm just doing what I do, right? And so I thought about that. And I said, man, and I could see the seriousness in her face. I said, man, I'm actually thinking about coaching. And if you'd like, I'd, uh, I'd work with your family. She said, yeah. And, and so we started. I said, I'm not going to charge you anything because I haven't done any training yet. But I had been up at that National Institutes of Health. There was a beta company at that time called, anybody here at 23 and me? Mm -hmm. A little genetics. Mm -hmm. But they were like beta, you know, they were like figuring out what they were doing. And they were dumping all this data on people. And they were like, yeah, these people are like, you know, I'm 20 years old and I got five chronic conditions that are coming in my life. Like, why am I waking up tomorrow? You know? And, and so they were saying, hey, maybe we need to give these people like a coach or somebody to help them interpret what does all that mean? And so I'm like, oh, this is interesting. You know, I tuck it away. Didn't know where that was going to come in. But that's what shaped this. And that's why in this little mini reveal, I'm kind of giving you these pieces because, all right. Now I feel like God is moving me somewhere else, but then he puts me right back in the seat at the association. Well, then this mom is giving me encouragement. No, this is where you're supposed to be. And I'm like, all right, I still don't understand it. You know, help bring in clarity. Well, the clarity came in that I just coached this family in a beautiful way to handle their family situation with their kids smoking some marijuana. And lo and behold, I'm actually that day patting myself on the back, which I don't normally do, you know? And I'm like, I do. that's nice. You know, they were like, I can find one of them. And then my daughter called, said, hey, I got to tell you, I just got caught smoking pot at school and blah, blah, blah. What the? <laughs> you know, nothing that I just imparted in a beautiful way to express and handle and support and, you know, help. No. And so that really made clear that we can learn how to do something. This stuff is hard to do. And even when we're trained in it, it's hard to do. We're human. And, but we have to do it because people's lives depend. And that's the thing I know in here that we know we're not just working to get people sober. We're not just working people to give them a transition out of an institution into a new life. We're helping people understand that there's power that's greater than them. And that when you're touching that, it just flows through us. And that that's really where the transformation takes place. Well, the coach has to like listen to his own rhetoric and put that into play. And so at that moment, I realized, all right, I'm definitely supposed to be doing this coaching. So I told the board that I'm resigning. And then I didn't know what I was going to do other than I have this family that I'm working. And all of a sudden, another family appears, and then another family, and then another family. And so I went from thinking that I was going to coach individuals in recovery to coaching families. Because, well, what's new in this continuum of care? Well, let's first look at what's old. When I first came in, this, we talked about it as a family disease. As we brought in health care, where we integrated it into it, we went to personalized care. Well, that kind of pushed the family idea out because now we're personalizing the care. We're getting the person the services that they need at where they're at. But we kind of forgot about the family a little bit. And yet the family's never changed in that role. And so now we've got all sorts of ways to take. And the reason that we didn't do that across the team is we didn't have a way of um, uh, commercializing. Um, there's a better word for that. Monetize. No, not monetize, but that's good. Um, yeah, you know, money always makes a difference. Uh, 
um, where, where you build capacity. Um, there's a fancy fun word that I like for that. Anyways, um, we didn't have a way to bring it to, uh, bring it to scale. There's the word I'm looking for. And that's because personalized was really hard to do. Well, in that past work that you were talking about, where we were moving care out of the hospitals to meet the age wave that was coming, we were saying, great, like we're just not gonna build enough hospitals to meet the demand of all the boomers retiring with the greatest generation. So we have to figure out different ways to deliver the services. And that's where that transformation. And so a lot of this stuff that had been built into the past was now built into what we're doing here in this space. And then I, again, I didn't understand that at the time when I'm like, why is God replanting me into this other space? And that's where, when that happened, then we get to, all right, I'm now coaching what I thought would be individuals in recovery. I'm coaching families. And then the city burned. And I was living out in Minnetonka, and I was planning to move down to either the North Loop or Lower Town. But both cities are burning, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to move to a city that's burning. I'm like, I was like, I don't know what to do. So I got in the car, and I just drove out of town. I'm like, i got to get out of town and figure this out. And as I'm driving out in the country, I just I started to feel more calm. And I'm like, yeah, this is kind of, I don't know, I've worked on farms in the summer, and, but that was work. But now all of a sudden, I'm like feeling calm out in nature. And then I'm like, oh, well, isn't that part of like health and wellness that like we're supposed to connect with our community? So uh, I pulled the car over, I rolled down the windows. I'm like, gosh, there's no noise. You know, I'm like, this is great. And then I see this little farm or sales sign. I'm like, I wonder how much a farm is, you know? And, and I go to my Bible study that I do with congressmen's uh, widow, Catherine, and a few other friends. We had put that together to help usher the congressman across the line. And, you know, she saw that it helped him. And she said, well, why don't you guys keep meeting out on my back porch? And all of a sudden we kind of realized she was kind of listening. We said, you want to join us? And, you know, three years now we've been doing that. And that's beautiful because she said, Max, this is a neat idea, but, like, you're not a farmer. Like, what are, what are you going to do? And I'm like, good question. I said, well, no, I'm just a guy that puts cowboy hat on People take pictures with me, you know, but like you don't have to be the person that does everything. And so that's where the idea really started to build in Germany was let's have a place where we can practice recovery. In fact, let's have a place that we can experience recovery because to explain recovery, holy smokes, like I got to where I understood it after a lifetime of living it. How do you explain that in 10 minutes? And then I thought, well, you know, I learned about feeding the world through this group that the faith community embraced called Feed My Starving Children. Anybody ever go off and quit? Yeah, yeah. We've all done it, you know? Well, what do you do? You're not like saving the world by shoving some rice into a thing and shipping it off to Africa. No, what you're doing is you're learning about food insecurity. Yeah, you were saving some people. Same way that I'm not going to save the world by coaching a few people. But what if we had a space in place that then was a place that people could come and experience it the same way that I learned about food insecurity by putting some rice in there? I'm like, okay, well, this little hobby farm was just, I'm going to buy a place because I need a place to live. Well, I ended up staying in my place, which I didn't want to. And, you know, I've been there for a number of years now, and I just let the lease go. So this place is going to have to happen because I'm homeless till the end of the month. So, uh, <laughs> You know, and, and that's where then the idea said, okay, if we have a space in place, what would we do there? Well, let's bring people down and let them touch the ground because using our hands and getting off of our phones is a great idea. But let's not restrict phones because we live in a freaking digital social world where, yeah, let's take selfies. You know, I got to have my cowboy out. I got to have my purpose. That's all my purpose is. So let's give them their phone, but encourage them to put it away. And let's use some of those biblical teachings of radical hospitality. When people, when we extend an invitation to you, when you actually arrive, it's not you're just showing up. Like, hello, friend, welcome. You're here, come on in. What do we do? You've been traveling? 
Well, what did George Washington do when people traveled at Mount Vernon? If you go to Mount Vernon, they had a little house up here. You could sleep there for the night. They had food in there because they realized people have traveled. Let's welcome them. Let's give them the things that nourish a human. So that's all kind of building into this place. And that's then where I'm like, all right. So you got coaching. That's what I do. I got this space in place where we're going to welcome people with radical hospitality. And we got some fields. All right, but what if you don't like the cold leaves? And what if it's winter? You know, so, okay, well, there is this thing called a greenhouse. So we can come up with ways to counter these different things. And then people are like, wow, why are people ever going to come out there? You know, where is the place going to be? You know, people don't go. I said, well, have you ever, anybody here ever go to the Landscape Arboretum? Yeah. Okay. So that's a destination. You have a purpose for why you're going there. That ever stop anybody from going there? No. And what kind of things did you do there? Nature. Nature. Walk. Walk hike. Anybody ever take a class there? Yep. They have all kinds of classes. You know, they have special events. You can go out there for the, you know, holiday lights. You can go out there for the spring. Well, I'm like, okay, well, why can't we do that stuff at our own place for our own people? You know, we can have people come out. We invite them out. And then when they're there, we give them things to do. So we can have our educational component, and then we can have events, we can have activities. Oh, great. Let's have, what do you got to do when you come into recovery? Well, there's those replacement therapies that we look for. I used to drink a lot, or I used to do drugs a lot. Still have to eat. Maybe I can actually learn how to cook. Oh, maybe we could have a cooking class out there. People would drive to the Mall of Mary. Anybody ever take a cooking class? Yeah. Yep. So, you know, people do this kind of activity. So how about art? Anybody ever have the therapy, art therapy? Anybody? I don't know. For me, when I do, it takes my mind off of things. Puzzles. Puzzles. There you go. Game nights. You know? Yep. Yep. You're channeling my thoughts. Music. Anybody else use music? I use music. Poetry. Poetry. You know, there's... There you go. Now, this guy, this guy's getting sending now. He wants to get the good clothes. Uh, yep, yep. That's in that's in phase two. No, yeah, yeah. You know, just gotta make sure phase one works. Hey, exactly. Yep, you gotta gotta start and then keep adding. Um, you know, and then we've also got the things that we can do like crafts, like woodwork. You know, could maybe make crosses. And if you didn't want to take your cross home, we can put it into the gift shop. And the other people that come that don't want to take the time to do it, they can have a note that you left for them on that I made this for you. Again, this idea that we're all connected. It's a place where we find the connection. Why am I connected to you? Because we're seeking recovery. But what if I'm not the person that's in recovery? What if I'm the family? Well, isn't that what we teach in peer supports and you know um, coaching? That there's dimensions of well being or wellness. You don't have to be in recovery, but if you're in a family with somebody that has an addiction, you're in the game, you know? So now recovery and wellness creates a way that we're bringing back an old idea, which was family, and just bringing it as a new idea, introduce it as a new idea, engage the family. Well, now have a place where people can come and experience what all that means. And so that's what the recovery branch is. And then, you know, the place that we're currently targeting, there we're, what am I doing? The pizza's not here yet, so you're good. All right, so um, <laughs> as we started going around, there's like a Goldilocks zone around the Twin Cities that, you know, as you're driving out, it doesn't matter if I start driving towards um, Stillwater, or if I start driving towards the Big Lake, or I start driving towards Wilmer, or I start driving towards Owatonna. Once I get a certain distance out, the world changes. And that's at about a half an hour. And there's another strange phenomenon that happens, that as I go a little beyond half an hour, Man, am I there yet? When am I going to get there? Geez, this is really far. So there's a Goldilocks zone around. 
that when you hit the 30 to 45 minutes, so, you know, this was three years of, I know that beltway around our area and everything that's been for sale and the iteration of this ranch, um, we really came from this three acre little house that I thought maybe I could have like some donkeys or something and some chickens to now like 120 acres that has a center and a place that families can retreat to when they're feeling all lost and confused and they can come and find people that care about them. And while they're in that little retreat, they can be looking out the windows and say, who are these people that are out there working in that organic garden, tending to that with care? Well, those are the families that used to be in here. And as we're teaching them the tools of recovery, they can, as we all of them gather, everybody who's on campus that day, as they gather for a meal together, because what do we do as humans? We have to eat. And isn't it better when we share a meal together with somebody? So isn't it fun when we can do an activity and then share a meal together? So that's built into the experience that you have when you come out. And then they say, well, who are the people that are going into the barns? Oh, well, the people that are going into the barns are going to any of those six classes. And they're people that are in recovery. They're coming down with somebody who's new. Maybe it's a peer support specialist that's bringing the person they're working with down to Deuce to make a gratitude journal and the leather work. You know, great things that are really helping people then learn and experience recovery. So that's kind of what the recovery ranch is. And then the thing that helps us get to the ranch is how do we keep moving this forward and sharing what this is and giving people a way of being a part of it. And that's what relevant recovery is. The ranch may or may not happen. All right, it's gonna happen, but it may not happen five minutes from now, you know, because, well, you've got to first negotiate the final parts of the price. And then you have to like work with the city and the county and everybody else and take care of all of those hoops. So the day the ranch is opening, I don't know. Is the ranch opening? I don't know. I've got it on higher authority, but I think it's happening, all right? So what do we do to make sure that we can start preparing for it? Because those of us in recovery know nothing changes quickly. So that's where we can up with relevant recovery. Let's just do relevant recovery because relevant recovery can support the formation of coaches who are supporting the development of families. And so how can then we as an organization support that? Well, that's on New Year's Day, you know, so this is the 2025 um, calendar of relevant recovery. And I know we got some pizza, we'll jump into that and um, we can do any questions. But so we have, while the other world is hungover and whatever, we get people together for the great goal set. And on that day, we have a bunch of coaches or peers, people that are familiar with what we do that are sitting at tables and as people arrive, they hear a little state of what's going on in the affairs of addiction and mental health. They learn some information and then they lay out a little plan for themselves. You know, we all know that phenomenon in January, everybody signs up for a health club and by March, nobody's there, you know? So in July, we're gonna have the great Regal set because people will have forgotten by the time we get to the second half of the year that they're actually working on goals. Hopefully, those that are engaged with a coach or a peer are getting motivated to stay involved. Those who aren't, well, maybe they'll come to another event and get re engaged again and run for a few months again. And then in between there, well, what did AA teach us? If you boil it all down, Dr. Bob said, it's all about love and service. So we already have two days out of the year that are dedicated to that. MLK Day, the National Day of Service. So we'll do an event and we'll partner with the Points of Light, which they recognize people that are in service to people and we'll recognize people's service to our community. And on the National Day of Love, anybody know what that one is? Valentine's Day. Yep. So that's that day where you're either really in love those are probably the people that we'll put up on the stage 
or like you've been in love for 40 years and you're like, okay, what are we going to do this year? Or you're like, ah, nobody loves me. It's the day of love. Well, come be in a community where we love you and enjoy. So that's the two days that we do fun things. And then it's all about family. So we honor our mothers on Mother's Day. And we honor our fathers on Father's Day. Mother's Day is brunch, flowers, food. Father's Day is show up with a barbecue and a band, you know. Um, and switch those again. Don't want to be gender, you know, anything. We'll switch them some years. We'll do whatever. Um, but that's that structure. And then Jan uh, um, July 31st. The reason that we chose July 31st to do the big reveal is because my friend and mentor, Jim Ramstead, that's his Friday day. So it's my personal way of doing a tip of the hat back. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> He's also the guy that took me to treatment and the guy that brought my children. Like, we got connection. But anyways, um, that's just my day to be able to give a tip of the hat and say, look, I'm only here doing all this because of the opportunity to work with him, work on parody, and move it forward. So in the future, Relevant Recovery is going to send a delegation of people around the world to find people that are innovating things in five areas. Uh, religion, science, medicine, recovery, and then find those spaces and places like the ranch where people are like, there's something in this space. Like Sedona, people say it's in the rocks. There's energy in the rocks. Well, we go find out what do people mean by that. Well, we experience things. So we send a delegation off and they bring back what they learned in their experience as well as the people that they learned from. And so that's what then sets up the innovation address every July. And then in November, we have a way that you put a little something in the bucket to help those that can't help themselves. And the way that it all operates is it's kind of a combination of three things. There's RCOs. There's organizations like AARP that advocate for people, but they also give their members services. They give them information, they give them tools, they give them discounts, they give them different things. And then a space in place like the Arboretum. And so we're a membership organization, you know? So we operate off of a membership. And when you come, just like the Arboretum, you can come with somebody who is a member. You can come and not be a member. You can just still come, you know. And then we have fees. Fees, if you want coaches, then pay a fee. If you don't want the coach, but you want access to the content that the coaches teach, then just buy a pass to the content. And if you want other services, well, great, we'll connect you. You know, if you don't want a coach, but you want a peer, well, we don't do peers, but we'll connect you to peers. And so that's that collaborative nature. And that's kind of what. The recovery ranch is relevant recovery that's helping to birth it and re relevant recovery, whether the ranch makes it. Now, some people are like, Max, what if that doesn't work? Okay, well, it doesn't work. I do coaching. <laughs> then we don't do the ranch. Like, no sweat. But relevant recovery will never go away because what we need right now is helping to equip coaches that equip families. And that's how we build out that continuum of care. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. And, uh, why don't we uh, turn it back over to Ron? Turn it back over to Ron. Any questions for John right now? I think we're going to have have a little fellowship lunch, and we can certainly we're not have lunch on the No, we we'll certainly have more conversation um, at that time. So that's that's what we've got, and we've got a plethora of pastors here uh, to pray for the food and and thank everybody for being here this day. So. I'm thinking maybe we haven't seen Dwight for a while, so I'm thinking Dwight maybe a little bit. Yes, yes. Thank you. Dear Lord, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to meet together, to share together. Thank you for John Magnuson and the vision that you brought to him and relevant recovery. We do ask that you would help us all to pray about how we can be involved, how we can be more connected in supporting the work that you're doing, and to be able to encourage each other because we each have ministries. But we're all working together on the same team when we're all serving you as part of the body of Christ. So thank you for the R3 collaborative. Thank you for this lunch and the food that's been provided. We ask your blessing on it and the rest of our time. 
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.